Okay, we are here live and direct at Hope House in El Zonte, Bitcoin Beach, El Salvador. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, young man? Um, Mike Peterson, uh, one of the, the folks here at Bitcoin Beach. Okay, um, Bitcoin Beach has now become legendary. Um, all around the world, I know that um, it's humbling for you, but it's actually the truth. Uh, on my way coming here, there were many people wearing Bitcoin Beach t-shirts on the airplane on the way here. So I knew that there were a lot of Bitcoiners coming here. Um, and this is all on the news that we're getting worldwide about El Salvador really being uh, the tip of the spear when it comes to Bitcoin ecosystem development. So um, why don't we talk about the history of Bitcoin in El Salvador, your back, let's first, let's talk about your background first. What is your background like? Sure, um, I am a business owner in the US. I have a seasonal business that, that uh, we run there and that afforded me a lot of time off uh, during the winter. And so came to El Salvador on a surf trip and fell in love with the country and decided to spend more and more time down here and start working with, there's a number of organizations running children's homes or working with women who have been victims of sex trafficking or people are starting churches. And so we started getting to know a lot of these folks and started working with them in kind of a support role, um, not being the ones actually working with the kids, but helping them, helping them find um, supporters, helping them get counseling um, and that sort of thing when they've gone through trauma that they experience here in El Salvador. And so, um, and we live here in El Zante during that time and we just fell more and more in love with the, the country and the community and but also saw a lot of the challenges here so around, many around what year is this uh we came down here originally in 2004 and in about 2014 we kind of decided to make this home okay. and so it switched from being just a vacation place to, to being the place that that we spent you know most of our time and effort um, okay. you know pouring into so my kids consider this home they grew up here uh they're bilingual Oh, uh, nice. They uh, they speak Spanish much better than I do at this point, and right. uh, and then yeah, we just kind of saw the opportunity, saw the challenges of people that were kind of cut off from the traditional financial system. So many moms and dads leaving to go to the U.S. illegally, and their kids growing up here without them, and because of that, you know, them not having a fam close family here, them joining the gangs. And so we saw this kind of cycle of destruction happening as, as the gangs grew, there was less economic opportunities, which forced more of the adults to leave. And so we really wanted to do something to break that cycle and start pouring into the young people here. And we happened at that time to, to have somebody who wanted to support what we were doing with Bitcoin. And as we started working Bitcoin into things, we saw that it had this huge impact just on the way they were thinking about things. They started thinking about money for the first time, about savings, about the, the time value of money, that if you don't spend something now, you, you can actually grow your wealth for the future and have that kind of element of deferred gratification. And so uh, that's kind of how it all, you know, started and then it just blew up from there. Okay, so before um, this person approached you about uh, Bitcoin in El Zante, what was your relationship with Bitcoin? I was uh, in following Bitcoin from the early days, kind of more from the monetary and economic policy side of it. Um, I was an economics major in university and always been kind of fascinated by what, why some countries thrive and, and others seem to be in these cycles of you know, never being able to, to get ahead. And so I saw this new money coming up that couldn't be debased by government, that wasn't controlled by government, and was super fascinated by it on one hand. On the other hand, I'm, I'm not a tech person. And those days, you, you, you know, it was a little bit tricky to buy Bitcoin and hold it. And so I didn't actually buy Bitcoin, I don't think, until like 2016 or 2017. Mm -hmm. But I was, I knew everything about it before I actually uh, made my first purchase. I was kind of one of those that, that dove down the rabbit hole first and actually bought it later. So when someone approaches you and says, hey, Bitcoin might do something good here, what is the roadmap that's going on in your head in terms of making it something that actually comes to fruition? 
Well, when they when when we were talking to, and it was actually wasn't even the donor; it was somebody that the, the donor had hired to kind of um, vet different organizations and people. And when they started explaining what they were looking for, I just had this light bulb go off because, I, you know, I saw this opportunity to create this circular economy that actually functioned on Bitcoin. And you know, most people, if you went to them with that idea, they would tell you you're crazy and, and there's no way that would never work, but. I could tell this was actually what this person was looking for. And so we kind of put this audacious proposal together that, hey, we want to do this. We want to start small with, you know, injecting Bitcoin and then getting stores to accept it. And we had this kind of three year roadmap that would basically lead to um, it being sustainable through Bitcoin tourism and then also people switching to, to bring their remittances in through Bitcoin. Um, surprisingly, it all happened much faster than we anticipated. We had this kind of three year, we thought we would be where we were maybe a year ago. And obviously we didn't have any dream that the country would adopt it, uh, you know, by now and be full bore, so. So, um, to kind of give a synopsis uh, to the listeners, uh, so we got a guy from America, he likes to surf. He comes to El Salvador, surfs around, couple years, he says, hey, I'm going to move here. I like it here. And when you move here, you start doing human development work as a not-for-profit. Um, yeah. And is that Hope House or? Yeah, initially it was just, we were just doing it. We actually wound up forming a nonprofit in the U.S. Um, and Hope House kind of came out of that. We're um, in the process of starting the legal entity for Hope House as a separate thing right now in El Salvador. We're, we're, we're in that government uh, waiting period wise sure, right now, but sure. yeah, it was, it definitely was kind of a grassroots thing. There wasn't a big plan initially. It, things just kind of started happening and more good things started happening and more people wanted to be involved and it just kept growing. So did you have a formalized organization before you started the Bitcoin uh, work? Or was it, a, it was something that you were doing on your own? Yeah, no, we had a, a formal organization okay. in, in the U.S. that oh, was supporting it, the, it, the other work that, that we do here. Work yeah. doing here. Yeah. And then there was this idea, so you've been doing the work here in terms of human development, and there's an idea, hey, you guys might be a good organization to add on to this idea of human development through economics via Bitcoin. Right? Exactly. So then you guys take that on, you have a roadmap of how you're going to do it. I would imagine that um, the first challenging hurdle is education. That's, I mean, that's the, almost the first and last hurdle, right? Um, because there, there has to be an education. So how challenging has it been and how challenging was it to start the educational aspect of Bitcoin for the local population? It was uh, kind of a trial and error learning. You know, initially we actually thought we needed to really focus heavily on the education and target the adults. And so we planned on having these, you know, week long classes where we would get into the history of Bitcoin and how it's mined. And, and we realized really quickly people's eyes just kind of glazed over. You know, they had kind of no interest in, in delving into that. And we were laying way too much on them. And so we kind of pulled back from that and went the other route of starting to just put Bitcoin into people's hands and getting them transacting it, specifically with the younger people that, that it made more um, sense to them. They're used to doing everything on their phone for them to be able to transact sure. digitally and remotely. Like they got it right away. Sure. And we found once you get people holding Bitcoin and transacting, then they become self-motivated to start learning about it. Why is it going up? Why is it going down? How does it work to send it from one place to another? You know, what, why is there different times to, to get confirmation when you're sending on chain and all those things. And so if they haven't actually done any transactions, it seems, you know, very highbrow and like, oh, this is confusing. But once they actually get doing the transactions, then doing the homework is easy. Right. And so how long were you guys doing it grassroots in terms of Bitcoin uh, education, uh, the application of Bitcoin to real world uses, buying this or buying this with Bitcoin or being paid in Bitcoin. And that's kind of what's going on. You're doing it slowly. You're letting people know more of the kids are downloading the wallets. In those days, what type of what wallets were the, were the kids downloading? 
So originally they were just using blockchain wallet. Um, okay. It was, you know, at that time, one of the more user friendly, straightforward, we were doing everything on chain. Uh, transaction fees were pretty low at that time. Um, but then right around the time transaction fees started to skyrocket, that's when a couple of good lightning wallets that were pretty usable came out. And so we switched everything over to Wallet of Satoshi. It's a company out of Australia. Mm -hmm. And they have a very user-friendly wallet and it, it worked very well for us for a time. Uh, as we grew and as there was, people had issues with their wallets or they had questions, it, it became a little more difficult because we didn't have you know direct access to the support team there. And at that time, around that time, uh, the folks from Galloway Money came to us and with this proposal to build a wallet specifically for our community to include the type of features that we wanted and to actually come here and spend time with the people, hear what their concerns are, actually understand how they want to use it. Because a lot of times there's a big gulf between uh, the developers and what they think makes sense and you know somebody who's 70 years old and, and lives in a house without electricity and charges their phone, you know, on a, with a solar charger and, you know, is making pupusas and, and her hands are dirty and, and trying to create the QR codes and all those things. So they saw like, okay, this is an issue. Let's, let's make it a way so that people can pay them directly from a map within the wallet or using a username and brought all these kind of more um, these features in that made it easier than cash because that was that's always the thing you're competing with They'll say well, it's easier just to take dollars Well, you have to make sure that it's easier to use Bitcoin and sure. so that's kind of the, the path that we've gone on Okay, um, excellent. So uh, Now uh, you got kids using these wallets then there becomes the question um, Me, you know being someone who's been using Bitcoin for some time in El Salvador, where are people actually getting Bitcoin from? Is, is it a situation where it's just Bitcoin ATMs or is there an exchange that people like to use in El Salvador that's available to the people here? Right now, because of the government's initiative and the way they've rolled things out with the, the Chivo ATMs, where they basically have zero fees, mm -hmm. and they've also installed Chivo ATMs um, in the U.S. in several locations where the majority of Salvadorans live. Mm -hmm. so. They've, they've made it very easy to, to use the ATMs. You know, outside of El Salvador, they, using Bitcoin ATMs can be very expensive, the fees can be high, but, yeah. but here it, it actually works pretty well. There's, there's also- no fees. There's no fees for, for um, the people using the, the Chivo wallet. So I, I'm not Salvadoran, I don't have access to the Chivo wallet, so when I use the ATM, I pay a, but it's still pretty reasonable, much less than you'd pay anywhere else. Right, and just to um, kind of clarify that for people, because I tried to download the Chivo wallet, you need a South, an El Salvadorian ID number to be yeah. able to have the Chivo wallet. And that's why um, those who are not El Salvadorian city citizens, when you come to El Salvador, you wouldn't use the Chivo wallet, you would use different wallets. And you can talk about the different wallets that um, are, are being used in uh, you, you know, your, your work with those wallets. So, um, all of a sudden then you're doing this work, things are going on, you're learning, you're learning about people and their learning abilities for, for um, Bitcoin, what works in terms of teaching people what doesn't work. You start making a little traction and the government gets an interest, right? The El Salvadorian government gets an interest. How long was it? You don't have to go into the details of it if you don't want, but how long was it? Because I'm sure it's a very interesting story. But how long was it from the government noticing what you guys are doing to Bitcoin becoming legal tender? So, so we kind of started our project around September of 2019. In the summer of 2020, there was an article written in Forbes talking about it. And I think that's what kind of first put us on the government's radar. This was kind of one of the first times they been featured in a publication like Forbes in a positive light. And how did Forbes find about it? Uh, I think just um, Peter McCormick, a podcaster, had come in December and had done, um, spent some time here and did a podcast with mm -hmm. us. And then there was some other people in the space that kind of did follow-up trips. And so I think the word kind of got out and the, 
this particular writer was focused on on the crypto space and so she kind of picked that up and, and ran with it and um and then just with all the social programs we were doing we had natural interactions with the different government ministers we we started a lifeguard program um, which the country never had before and so we had i think about 80 lifeguards become internationally certified they're being paid in bitcoin so we we're working with the minister of tourism on that and we were working with the Minister of the Economy on some other things. And so we would always kind of bring to them like, hey, you guys have this unique opportunity to, to go down in history as the first country in the world to adopt Bitcoin. Right. And you have an opportunity to change the narrative about El Salvador overnight. And there'll be all these kind of ripple effects of that that will bring jobs and opportunities to the people. And so I, I don't know exactly when they got you know, super serious about it but i think it was kind of a gradual process as they kind of we kept hammering on them the opportunity that was there and and they kept seeing more doors be open and more positive press you know bloomberg did a, a piece and there was a number of, of other organizations that came down and were doing news pieces on this and i think that made the government take notice and when did you wake up and know damn this is happening this really might become legal tender like this is not just talk, like actually they listen to us. So we had um, a, a documentary crew here from Vice News. Um, I think it was in April and it was either late April, April or early May. 2021? 2021. Okay. And um, I was actually out of the country. I was back in the U.S. and. The team was filming them talking to the Minister of Tourism and the, the guys from Vice were questioning her about Bitcoin and for the first time ever she gave like a full-throated support of Bitcoin and why it was so great to have it here and all the benefits of it and before they had always been you know very nice but very like closed-lipped about Bitcoin and so I just sensed that there was something going on you, you know government mm -hmm. officials don't Right. By yeah. accident, you know, talk about things like right. that. So I could tell that was probably coming from above. And then I also knew there was some stuff going on with, with the guys from Strike. They were, they were not returning my calls. They were, you know, avoiding my questions. So I knew that there was something going on that they, they weren't allowed to talk about. Right. And, and I also started getting some calls from connections I have in the government here telling me that there was something going down in Miami. And so I hadn't even planning on going to Miami, but I was decided, hey, I need to make sure I'm there. Right, and, and you talk about the event. Bitcoin conference yeah. in 2021. Exactly. Right, and that's, that was a watershed moment. Yeah. That probably was, like, it'll probably be remembered as a historical event, huh? Yeah, and even the announcement itself, I mean, I knew something was coming, but it was actually, on a much bigger scale than I anticipated. Okay, I so thought, you didn't even know that the, the, the announcement was going to be made there. I knew they would make they were making an announcement, but I you thought know. it was maybe like you could pay your taxes now right. in Bitcoin or not just or something it, like that. I didn't know it was going to be a uh, we're adopting right. Bitcoin. Everybody's going to accept it. Right. You know, we're going all in on this. So when you heard it, how did you feel? It felt surreal. It I felt it felt kind of like wow this is this is kind of surreal like i honestly i, I felt um sad that the team from here wasn't there with me at the conference all these people right. were cheering all these people were excited right. and you know and i look around and you know none of the people that have been doing all the hard work here and preparing the ground and doing all that none of them right. were at the conference to kind of share in that moment so so that felt a little like a bit of a bummer but you know kind of get over that and just realize just what a great move forward it was for the country mm -hmm. and um, just all the opportunity that would be sure. coming. It, it, it actually took a couple weeks to really right. all settle in like how monumental this was. Right, right. I mean, I can imagine after the announcement, I mean, what are you doing? You're sitting around Miami, you're drinking cocktails and you're like, life is never going to be the same. I mean, I actually had to get on a flight like right after the announcement, I would have my suitcase there with me uh -huh. waiting for the announcement. And then I had to like run and jump in an Uber and, and I almost missed my plane. Uh -huh. So I was kind of like, it was when I was finally on the plane and then I'm sitting there by myself, like excited, but nobody to like talk to right. about it. You're just like, right. 
So right. it was, yeah. So then, once you know that it becomes is becoming legal tender, and I believe it became officially legal tender in September of 2021, um, what are you doing in your office? Because first of all, I know a lot of people won't come talk to you about Bitcoin, but I want to talk about Hope, Hope House and the program that you guys do, right? Because it'll give people more of a sense of how Bitcoin fit into uh, what you guys were doing, and it actually is kind of poetic that Bitcoin came through the social service works that you're doing because, you know, the moral argument for Bitcoin is about human development, yeah. human freedom, um, human beings actually um, not living in poverty, um, people being empowered, people being their own banks, and what have you. So actually it's very poetic that an organization that was doing that without Bitcoin would be one of the organizations, not the main organization, actually making Bitcoin as legal tender a reality in El Salvador. So what actually does Hope House do? What are the different programs that you guys have? So all our, our main focus here is increasing opportunity and making El Zante and the surrounding area a place where, where young people can thrive and actually build a future. Um, as I said before, historically people saw kind of two routes, they would join the gang or they'd go legally to the US and, and work in a job that a lot of times was way below their, their education and skill level. And so our goal was to kind of turn that around where there would actually be incentive for the kids to go on to high school and then go on to university, that there would be better paying job opportunities here, that parents would be able to grow up, like see their kids grow up and not watch them, you know, through Zoom, you know, a thousand miles away as they're working in the US. And so that was, has always been our goal and, and Bitcoin has actually helped turbocharge that. It's, it's helped people start to realize, hey, if I, don't spend this on this Coke today or this toy today or rims for my car. Like if I save this in an asset that's gonna go up in value over time, I can actually build a business. Mm -hmm. I can buy livestock. I can provide better education for my kids. Right. And so um, the majority of our programs are focused on community unity, on family unity and health. We we try to integrate everything. So even like, for example, our, our uh, scholarship program that we have for the unit, kids to go to university, uh, part of that we require them to help us work with the elderly and the families who have members that have some type of disability. And so we have these scholarship students, they do outreach in the community and we have Bitcoin stipends and other things that we provide for these families that are in bad situations. But it, it helps connect them, these kind of promising young people with these struggling families and build those friendships. And so everything we do is kind of focused on that. Right now we have a housing initiative that we're doing where it'll be actually the first, I believe the first where people are getting their mortgages where they'll be paying in Bitcoin. They won't be denominated in Bitcoin because you don't want to denominate your debt in Bitcoin, but they'll actually be able to use the, um, you know, use lightning and not have to go, you know, wait in line all day to pay their mortgage, but they'll be able to send their payment over the lightning network. And we have subsidized loans that they'll be, so it makes it accessible so that the people who actually live in El Zante can participate in the growth and opportunity here, can have a home that has title, they can start building generational wealth for their kids. And so everything's kind of focused around that. We have about 20 different programs that integrate different things in different ways like that. But always, for us, Bitcoin is not the end goal, it's the tool. Right, yeah, that's, that's excellent, man. I, I love to hear that. And um, definitely salute for the work that you're doing, man. Um, someone had to do it, you know, for real. Now, um, Miami happens, it's a historical moment. And then we're all kind of looking and seeing what's waiting, all of us around the world who are cryptocurrency, big t Bitcoin enthusiasts. We then see something in the news where there's going to be a thing called Bitcoin City. It is very exciting in terms of uh, what some of the benefits would be on uh, Bitcoin City. Um, the tax 
structure is very appealing to an investor like myself. Um, the uh, environmental mindfulness of using only renewable energy that would be coming from the inactive volcano. And I have to do a little bit more research on whether that's an inactive volcano, or that's an extinct volcano, or what. Um, some people exp express some concern of, well, is that volcano going to blow up? And I, I'm sure there have been geologists that have done the studies. I'm sure they wouldn't have chosen a site if something's going to happen. I mean, you can give me a little bit more insight on all of that. But I've seen some aerial drone footage of the area, the La, La Union area. Um, it's right by the water. Um, it looks beautiful. Uh, zero income taxes, zero corporate taxes, zero uh, real estate taxes, zero capital gains taxes, only VAT or what's known as sales taxes. Um, I wanted to know, what do you know about Bitcoin City? What can you tell us about Bitcoin City? When you found out about Bitcoin City, how did you feel about it? And what is the best way for people to engage with Bitcoin City? What's the timeline? Bitcoin City for those of us who are excited and would be willing to move there tomorrow. <laughs> so I, I, a lot of this is is just going to be, um, you know, stuff that I don't have any inside information on, but mm -hmm. just from how I've seen things come about, what, what I think is happening. I think we're still in the aspirational stages of this. I think the government sees an opportunity to attract um, freedom-loving people in the Bitcoin space who have, who have accrued a lot of wealth through Bitcoin and want to use it to actually build something for their grandkids to, to build a better future. And so I think the location they've chosen is, is a great location. You have the, the Gulf there that kind of ties Nicaragua and Honduras and El Salvador all together. It, it's beautiful. It's been undeveloped because that was kind of the center of the war. And so you won't have to displace a big population of people. You know, obviously that's always a concern when you do a big project is who's going to be impacted negatively. And so obviously we hope that they do that in a responsible way and that people that are displaced are actually not displaced, but get to participate in something that's going to be beneficial to them. Um, but I, I don't, see that as being a place you're going to be able to buy a house next year. I mean, right. I think this is kind of a 10 year plan, mm -hmm. but I think what you're going to see and you're already seeing it, you know, as, as you said, you saw all these people with Bitcoin shirts on your, your airplane flight coming in. You're seeing all these businesses that are already coming in and they have kind of staged plans of first, we're going to open up a location in San Salvador or, or in El Zante here near us. And with longer term plans, once that gets up and going, then they'll maybe move their headquarters there. And so I think for the government, it's, it's a no lose. I think they have this kind of aspirational program that will bring in the brightest and the most energetic people from around the world that will want to participate in it. And it'll be this global you know, effort to, to build this. But in the meantime, the rest of the Bitcoin infrastructure in El Salvador will be built out by all these excited Bitcoiners. How busy are you these days? Been pretty busy, been pretty busy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to take some time uh, to get back out and surfing this last year. I mean, that's part of the reason I came down here was to surf. And last year with everything, I think I only went out three or four times. Wow. I think I gained like 20 pounds. And so I, I'm like, okay, we've, we've done our sprint. We, you know, we, we had to just put our head down. There were so many opportunities we had to do that. but. Now we're trying to find a more like sustainable, I gotta wanna get back out in the water and, and enjoy being here in El Zante, not be in front of my keyboard all day. Sure. So, but the exciting thing is there's so many people coming in, people that are much smarter than me, people that are more skilled in all these different areas. And so we don't have to do it all. You have all the whole Bitcoin ecosystem moving in here and we can focus on the, the community programs, the, the things that you know originally brought us into this and so that's kind of been um, our goal is to make sure we don't lose focus of the community here and the people here and to make sure we allow everybody else to, to do a lot of the heavy lifting sure now for those people who are doing this uh, bitcoin tourism and they find out about hope house and particularly the historical role that hope house played into implementing a bitcoin ecosystem and educational um, foundation. There are going to be a lot of people who 
and say, hey, you guys are doing good work while I'm here. Maybe I'll volunteer some time to you guys. Do you guys have a program for tourists to come and volunteer their time for some of the programs that you're doing? We're, we're working on that because we're already getting a ton of different requests and, and from super qualified people. I mean, CEOs of companies, coders, people with all these different skills. And so uh, right now we're trying to figure out how to best harness that energy. Um, so far we've done kind of simpler things where we'll allow people can come in and participate in the English classes that we're doing. That's an easy thing to plug people into and then they get to know the local people and they, they need kind of uh, natural English speakers to be able to speak with. But um, kind of going forward, our hope is to start bringing in people to start mentoring the young people here. So say somebody's a coder, we'd like to have them come in and you know if they're only here for a short time, maybe they just give a one night talk about what it means to be a coder and, and what tools people can use. If they're going to be here longer, maybe they can start doing classes and get people on that road and, you know, hopefully develop these relationships that once the young people get those skills, they can help them get their first job, they can kind of help them make those connections. And so we're, we're trying to, to harness that right now, but we've just had so many different things going on that it's, it's happening a little slower than we'd like, but that's definitely you know, on the roadmap. Sure, and I'll put your uh, website on the um, in the description of this video that you know people can just click to your website if they want to come. When you guys come to uh, El Zante, aka Bitcoin Beach, you can easily find Hope House, find Mike, and if you guys want to volunteer, you just be able to go to their website and co contact them beforehand. That's how I got here. Um, uh, place I'm staying is about 10, 10 minutes walking distance from here and um, it's really really easy to get to it's a really nice place Bitcoin Beach but I want to ask a question so we have El Zante which is known as Bitcoin Beach then you have the app called Bitcoin Beach and then some people say there's a house called Bitcoin Beach um, could you tell me what the distinctions are uh, I don't know about the house I haven't heard that I think it's uh, this house okay okay this house. yeah I, I mean for, for us, Bitcoin Beach was, was never a location. We actually have another city on the other end of the country that, that, that we're doing kind of a similar thing. It's a little behind where we're at here, but we also call that Bitcoin Beach. What's the, the name the, of that? Uh, Punta Mongo is the area. Okay. Yeah. But the idea is, was that it would be kind of spread along the coast here. Um, that it would, it would all be Bitcoin Beach. And so we've, yeah. we've had some people say, oh, you're trying to change the name of El Zante to Bitcoin Beach. No, it's Bitcoin Beach is, is more of a movement than a location. Got it, and got so, it. That's very interesting. But when, you know, when you Google Bitcoin Beach, El Zante comes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's just because where it started here. Yeah. And so, and then the Bitcoin Beach wallet was, it was, that was just the easiest thing to, to call it as we started it as part of the community. Um, it's actually now a um, standalone company that, that's been spun off from Galloway Money and they've, they've actually raised their first seed round and so they're, we're working right now, they're, I think they're going to rebrand it a little bit just to make a distinction between the business that's forming there mm -hmm. and the, um, you know, the, the yeah. non-profit aspect of, of what we're doing here and, and I'm not officially involved with the wallet there, it's all just been um, us giving them feedback and them helping us for free with <laughs> and filling in our uh, lack of technical abilities. So, but they actually did, uh, when they spun the company off, they set aside a good portion of that for uh, local members here and for the project itself. So Great. it's uh, something we're pretty excited about. Okay, so we have um, Hope House, which is an actual location, is actually a house called Hope House in El Zante. Yep. And then you have a not-for-profit that you're working at, but that's not called Hope House, is it? I think, yes, it, it will okay. be, it'll be, it'll be Casa Esperanza in okay. Spanish, yeah. Yes. So. so there'll be Hope House, the not-for-profit, Hope House, the house itself, the location, the abode, the office called Hope House. Then you have Bitcoin Beach, which is uh, the moniker that's been given to El Zante, but it's actually more of a philosophical idea that covers any place that's doing Bitcoin along the beach, um, where there's actually a sister community um, that is also sometimes referred to as Bitcoin Beach. But then uh, there's the location Big Bitcoin Beach that most people know to be El Zante. But then there's the app called Bitcoin Beach. <laughs> that, because this, I want people to be really clear yeah. on this because I have to learn all of this. 
So I want to make it really easy for people. So that app called Bitcoin Beach is what you would download when you get, you know, out of the airport at, uh, at the airport here in El Salvador. You would download a Bitcoin Beach uh, app wallet that's on um, iPhone and also Android. Yeah, and, and just one, one kind of, it's sad to even have to say, but we, we have excluded U.S. Uh, People that are connected to the U.S. App Store just because of U.S. financial regulations and yeah, no the millions of dollars it costs to jump through all their hoops. So, yeah, so anybody, anybody, anybody but Americans are welcome to use it. <laughs> yes, anybody but Americans are welcome to use the Bitcoin Beach app. But if you're an American and you land here, what uh, wallets? Um, I don't know um, if you would suggest. I mean, Strike works really well yeah, here. A lot of people use Moon Wallet. Yeah. Um, I, I like Moon Wallet. Um, yeah, I use both. Wallet, wallet of Satoshi works well. So there, there's definitely lots of uh, okay. you know, good wallets to, to use. Yes. Um, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet is nice because it has a map function in it. It shows you all the different places that, it, you know, except Bitcoin and it's, it, it makes it a little easier. But, but the other wallets work. Right. If you awesome. can't get the Bitcoin Beach Wallet right now if you carry an American passport. <laughs> But that's that's awesome. what it's come to. Yeah. Uh, American passport okay. is, uh, you know, it used to be the most sought after. Now, yeah. now <laughs> it's like uh, yeah. a weight around your neck to yeah. carry around with you. So. Yeah. Um, so as we close this, uh, where do you see all of this going in the next five years? I see it, it just bringing hope into a country that hasn't had hope for a long time. Of people actually want being proud to be from El Salvador, people seeing opportunities here. There's a reason to continue on in school. There's a reason to sacrifice and build a business. And so I just think you're gonna have this gravitational pull of people who are excited about what's happening here from outside wanting to come in, but people from inside increasing their skill levels and, and kind of rising up and becoming leaders in the field. Yes, absolutely. Now, um... I, I definitely see that once people get more used to Bitcoin and can actually understand what it is. I talked to my taxi driver. Um, he thought Bitcoin was a great idea. He said that it's actually causing him to save more. Um, cause we see that across the board. Yeah. It's, it's we see very that, interesting. You know, and then there's a, there's a young man who works at the hotel where I was staying and I asked him, you know, how do you feel about Bitcoin? He said he didn't care either way, one way or the other. Then I showed him the five-year chart of Bitcoin. <laughs> and I showed him that five years ago, Bitcoin was $960. If during that time, you know, while you're working, you save $960 worth of Bitcoin, it would be worth $40,000 right now. And when I, I showed him that and he understood, his eyes lit up and he said, I'll be taking Bitcoin from now on, <laughs> right? It was that easy. Yeah. He said he just didn't know. So I think that there needs to be a little bit more education, probably from the government through, uh, you know, TV programs or media programs where it can be explained to people that it is a, uh, it's a store of value that is appreciating way faster than the appreciation and, or lack thereof of the American dollar and that saving it is actually really preparing for your future and having a foundation for your future. So I think that it's a great thing. So when he understood that, he said, oh, that's why they're making this happen. So it's a really good thing. And I actually did some calculations. I'm a numbers guy, so I did some calculations and I, and I saw that, you know, if it continues at this pace in the next 10 years, El Salvadorians, if they start saving even a percentage, um, a small percentage, they per capita will be some of the wealthiest people. Uh, in the world, so um, he saw that and he couldn't he, he couldn't wrap his head around it. But you could tell that he was inspired, right? Yeah. So um, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to meet one of the people. Um, you seem like a very humble guy, but you're one of the people who made this happen. That's just a that's just a historical reality. So I know I have a sense of history. I spend most of my time studying history and studying different people in history, why things are the way they are. It gives me a good um, lens to the future because of being able to, to identify historical patterns. So uh, during this time, I know my grandchildren will ask me, where were you? And I can say, hey, I was here in El Salvador and I met Mike. 
Yeah, they're gonna say you met Mike, the Mike, <laughs> the guy from Hope House and Bitcoin Beach. You put it in the ear of the you know of the people who make these types of decisions to make it happen because I don't. I suspect that El Salvador is the first, but it will not be the last. Nope, it definitely is gonna be just the first of many dominoes to fall. Yes. Yeah, so Mike, thank you so much for taking some time to do this forty-minute interview. Um, but um, again, it's an honor and a pleasure to have met you, man. And um, thank you for the great work that you've done on behalf of not only the Bitcoin community. Thank you for being willing to, to travel here. I know travel these days can, can be a little daunting. So I'm just excited that you and everybody else that keeps showing up here are so excited about this. All right, man. So thanks a lot. And uh, I'll be back. And let's do another interview in a year and see what's changed. Perfect. All right.